Well, thanks. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give you this talk. All right. So uh, this is the title, and I'm going to be talking about this paper that we just posted, uh, actually just appeared yesterday, on the Condensed Matter Archive. So this is a sort of straight up Condensed Matter talk, but for high energy, I've tried to phrase it for high energy audience, and I hope there's some interesting things that have to do with. Uh, you know, physics in its unified sense, as we heard yesterday. So I, I benefited from three excellent collaborators in this talk. Uh, Richard Davison's a postdoc at Harvard, Blaise Couture's a postdoc at Stanford, and Luca's a uh, second year student, grad student at Stanford. It's a condensed matter tradition to put photos of your collaborators. <laughs> I think so. I can try to import it. Uh, OK. so. Um, this is sort of maybe in, in somewhat in the spirit of Natty's talk uh, yesterday. This is going to be sort of an attempt to make sense of a very big topic in condensed matter physics, which is fluctuating superconductivity from a point of view that made sense to, to us, okay, and hopefully to you too. And so the starting point is going to be hydrodynamics. So let me remind you about what, what hydrodynamics is. So hydrodynamics is the universal uh, long wavelength physics of a general system, at, let's say at finite temperature. Uh, and so at the very late times and very long wavelengths, all that you care about, the only thing that doesn't, hasn't already decayed are conserved charges, the currents that correspond to the conserved charges. And if you've broken a symmetry, then you also have Goldstone bosons. Okay, so these are all uh, protected quantities that for one reason or another decay more slowly than uh, generic excitations of your system. Okay, so you hit, you have some, some medium, you hit it, you wait long enough, and all that you have left eventually are um, excitations of conserved charges in Goldstone bosons. Okay. So let me tell you in, in one slide how a conventional metal like you know, copper or whatever works uh, from a hydrodynamic point of view. Okay. So, what are the, so first, so the conventional metal, there are no Goldstone bosons, so what are the conserved charges that we have to worry about? Well, what could there be? It's conservation of energy, conservation of charge, conservation of momentum. Okay. In a conventional metal, momentum degrades very quickly due to scattering off impurities off the lattice, so let's forget about momentum. Uh, then you have energy and charge, and so these do couple, but actually in a conventional, cup, conventional metal, the coupling is weak due to an emergent uh, charge conjugation symmetry. Uh, so let's focus uh, just now on just charge. So charge density clearly is conserved, and it has to obey uh, this conservation equation. Then to get hydrodynamics, you need to close, you want to get some equations, let's say for the evolution of the charge density, and so to do that, I need another expression for j so that I can sort of get a different, one differential equation for one variable. And so then you have these things called constitutive relations, and that's where the universal low energy bit comes in. Of course, this is true as a microscopic statement. The constitutive relations are true in effective field theory in a derivative expansion. Okay? And so what you do is you, you say, well, j equals, and then you do a derivative expansion of whatever else you have on the right. And in this case, all we have is the charge density. Uh, so we're going to have the gradients of D, and then we'd have higher order terms that are going to be subleading. And so there's a coefficient here that appears at D, and then the meaning of this is very clear. If we plug this back into here, we get a diffusion equation for rho, and D is a diffusion constant. Okay, so charge diffuses. From this formula, we can get the conductivity. All right? So this goes back to the third paper that Einstein wrote in, in 1905. Um, so, so J, the current, is given by the gradient of the charge density. The charge density, we can write as, is related to the chemical potential locally, so d rho d mu grad mu. This d rho d mu, that's called the charge susceptibility, okay? That's how much charge you get when you change the chemical potential. Let's call that chi. Minus grad mu is just the electric field, okay? And uh, in some gauge where at is zero, so ax is zero. And so now j is e, so that's Ohm's law, and then the connectivity we see is a diffusion constant times the charge susceptibility. Okay, that's called the Einstein relation. Okay, so that's how, uh, let's say, you're interested in the connectivity. That's how you relate the connectivity to a hydrodynamic quantity d, which is a diffusion constant, and chi, which is a thermodynamic quantity. Okay, that's the conventional metal. 
So uh, next up, oh, sorry, yes. So before we start talking about superfluids and superconductors, I want to preempt a confusion that is going to come if I don't do this. Uh, so I just told you that the conductivity is given by a diffusion constant. Okay, that seems pretty reasonable. Charge. So which 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 event? This one. Right, but uh, let me see. So, um, yes, okay, okay. There's more to go. What do you mean? There's more to go. So uh, I think so. What's relevant are are the the natural time scales. So for example, the electron volt and so on. And it's definitely slow. And that's the whole point. So the whole point of uh, Landau's. Let, let, let me come back to this. I think it's not too essential. Um, that's definitely a true formula. Okay. Um, and it, it's definitely true that diffusion is the slowest process that, that's happening. However, so to preempt the confusion, it's going to be more important later. In fact, charge in a metal doesn't diffuse, okay? If I put a lump of charge <coughs> in a metal, it just exponentially just decays, okay? It doesn't diffuse, okay? And that's due to screening due to Coulomb interactions, okay? So I just want to spend a second, uh, this is something you probably learned in you know, high school or uh, early in your undergrad, that if you take a conductor, and so you solve Maxwell's equations coupled to Ohm's law, what you find is charge just decays exponentially. There's no diffusion, all right? Nonetheless, the Einstein relation is true. So what's happening here? Uh, so so this is an important point that's not emphasized often enough, that the, that the conductivity that's defined in Ohm's law is measured with respect to the total electric field, not the external electric field. So you apply an electric field to the medium, the medium polarizes, it will generate another electric field that counteracts the one that you apply, and the one that goes into Ohm's law is the total one. But the Green's function is defined with respect to the external electric field. Okay? And this difference means that microscopically, the degrees of freedom decay exponentially, but the conductivity, which is with respect to this total electric field, still obeys the Einstein relation and still diffuses. So let me, we can, depending on your approach to things, there are two ways of thinking about it. So let's say the conductivity is the density density two point function. Let's think of free electrons, the density is psi dagger psi, okay? So uh, in the absence of a Maxwell field, the conductivity is, is, a is a calculation like this. It's a density, it's a current current two point function, okay? This is some loop of currents. Uh, and this is the insertion of psi dagger psi, okay? So this, is what you calculate to calculate sigma, okay? However, screening means you have to add the Maxwell Coulomb interaction, which is the one of a K squared at each of these vertices. And when you resum this, uh, this series, you get this extra term here, okay? That's nothing else than otherwise known as a dielectric constant, okay? Uh, not constant, let's include the omega and K dependence. And when you put it all together so that you get the external, so another way of saying that is the total field is the external one divided by the dielectric constant. When you put that all together, you'll find that what was a diffusion pole that you have in sigma, so which is defined with respect to E total, actually becomes gapped. Okay, you get this extra term here. And so now at k equals zero, omega decays exp uh, exponentially quickly. Okay, so charges don't diffuse, but the conductivity is calculated as though they diffuse. Okay, it's a... Uh, Yes, yes, of course. So, uh, so my point, so this, this is my point. For uh, I'm preempting a question that I'm 100% sure Shiraz was going to ask later, uh, which, is, which is that, because we're going to get to, so it's going to be important for the difference between superfluidity and superconductivity in a minute. The Maxwell field, you do not include, you don't do MHD to calculate the conductivity. You, you turn off the Maxwell field, okay, and that's how you calculate the conductivity. Uh, yeah, yes, this, 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 yes, 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 absolutely. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. Okay, so now let's do superfluids. So in a superfluid, uh, we have an additional hydrodynamic variable, which is the Goldstone boson, which is the phase of the U1 that's broken. And uh, so this now appears in hydrodynamics, and there's a new quantity called the superfluid velocity, which you define it like this. This M will come to uh, later. It's, it's just there to make up units. It's not any particular. We'll see what it is later. Okay, it's just a, it's just a scale, a mass scale. You don't assume it's any single particle mass or anything like that. It's just a mass scale. Uh, right, and now the superfluid, the, the superfluid velocity doesn't obey a conservation law. The analogous thing it has is something called the Josephson relation, uh, which sort of comes from gauge invariance. And so that's the following. So we want, we need, we're going to need to close the hydrodynamic equations. We're going to need something analogous 
to the constitutive relation to the sorry to the conservation law for, for the new hydrodynamic variable u phi, and that goes as follows. So the u phi dt is um, just changing the order to do it is grad d phi dt, and then the Josephson relation says that d phi dt uh, is given by the chemical potential mu minus mu. Okay, it's, it's sort of it's uh, well that that just is the Josephson equation. Okay. So we can use that, right? And so now, the con the constitutive relation uh, J is going to be what we have. So now again, we have to write down all the terms we can in a derivative expansion. And I think Shiraz, you want here, so I should say I've killed momentum. Okay. This, uh, um, so so now we have this derivative of rho, but now we have a vector u phi that we can also stick in at zeroth order there. And the coefficient of this we're going to call rho s. Okay. Uh, so again, this is sort of saying that the time-dependent phase and the chemical potential are sort of gauge equivalent. Okay, that, that's how you can, can read this equation. Okay, so now let's get the current again. So J is this. So U phi, let's write down DDT, that brings out an I omega. Okay, the I omega we put on the bottom here. So this term becomes rho S, I over omega grad mu. All right, Did that, everyone got that? The DDT came from here and I put it on the bottom. I omega is one over DDT. And then as before, this D becomes D chi grad mu, grad mu is the electric field again, so we have the diffusive part, but now we have an extra term that diverges as omega goes to zero, and that's, that's the superconductivity. Okay, that's the statement that the conductivity is infinite. Okay? It follows from very simple uh, effective derivative expansion arguments. Okay, now, so now this is why I gave you this thing before, so the, the conductivity is infinite effectively because diffusion has been replaced by a, it's called a second sound mode, the, the motion of the, the supercurrent. And as you know, though, in a superconductor, which is what we really want, the U1 symmetry is gauged, so it's coupled to electromagnetism. And when you do this coupling, the electromagnetism will gap out this Goldstone sat over Higgs mechanism, as always. This is exactly this, this is no different than what happened before to the diffusive mode getting gapped. Okay? You have to sum all those bubble diagrams. And so the conductivity is, as before, measured with respect to the total electric field. And so it's the unscreened superfluid hydrodynamics that determines the conductivity, even in a superconductor. So you don't have to worry about the gauge field. Okay? So the superfluid hydrodynamics correctly got the infinite conductivity at zero frequency, and we didn't have to put in any gauge fields. Okay? Just, to, just to clarify that. All right. So we've understood very simply how a metal works and how a superconductor or slash. This is why also in condensed matter the words superfluid and superconductor also often used somewhat interchangeably. All right, so this is not the whole story. So let's be, in particular, let's be in two space dimensions where a lot of interesting things happen. So superfluids can have defects in them, okay, and uh, in particular can have vortices. And in fact, as we'll see, generically there, there are vortices, uh, as we'll come to. And so what, what it turns out that a vortex can actually relax the supercurrents, okay, it can relax this conserved quantity that's making the conductivity infinite, and how does that work? Uh, well, we can think of pair producing, so this is a vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pair, or just start with two that happen to be close together. The lines represent lines of constant phase, okay, there's a phase. And so if you go around a vortex, the phase winds by 2 pi, okay? So these lines go 0, pi, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi. <coughs> the, these, these are constant phase lines that go from 0 to 2 pi as you go around, okay? And when they're close together, they can cancel out so that there's no phase if you go along here. There's no winding of the phase, but if you go through here, the phase winds by 2 pi. The most mathematically rigorous way to do this is to put your, put your um, system on a spatial torus, pair produce some vortices, wind one of them around the torus, and then annihilate it again. Okay? So as you stretch the vortices, so as you do that, stretch the vortices apart, and then you generate, so they, they can go off to infinity or they can go around the torus and annihilate. When they go off to infinity, they've created a winding of, of 2 pi of, of the phase. Okay? And um, a gradient of the phase is a supercurrent, right? That, remember, that's, that, that's, 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 that's this equation, right? So in the same way that they can create a phase, a phase difference, they can also undo a phase difference, right? So if I set up a phase gradient, which is, so I set up, you know, I have a circle, I set a supercurrent going around that circle, that, that's supposed to last forever. But if I have uh, vortices, what will happen is the vortices will start moving transversely across the sample and it will start unwinding the phase for me, okay? And because the phase is, this winding is topological, you need a topological thing like a vortex to, un, to, to, to unwind it, all right? So uh, anyway, so vortices, this is called flux creep resistance in, 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 in condensed matter physics. Uh, and so uh, vortices can, 
relax your what you thought was a uh, hydrodynamic variable. Okay. Now, however, if this process is sufficiently slow, so it's a weak uh, degradation of the supercurrent, then you can hope to capture that within hydrodynamics, and you expect that infinite connectivity you had, which is associated the infinite lifetime with the supercurrent, uh, to get relaxed, and so this omega is the uh, inverse lifetime or the decay rate of the supercurrent. Okay, so now we're, we're relaxing uh, this quantity. So what you'd expect to happen is the connectivity to obtain this kind of form. Okay, with this again, this pole. Remember, you Fourier transform that it means that the current will decay on an inverse time scale omega. So what this talk is going to be about is this this omega. Right? So this this problem, this is flux peak resistance has been around since the uh, you know 60s, 50s, 60s is well understood. Uh, in certain regimes. Okay, so let me just tell you the regime where it's best understood. So, as you know, in two dimensions, there's something called the costless stout Berinsky BKT transition. Okay, and so that tells you that above a certain temperature, if you, you, you think you're in the superfluid phase, you proliferate vortices. Okay, and these vortices disorder the phase and they kill the long range order, even though the condensate the condens uh, survives. Right, so if you're at a high enough temperature, in two dimensions, you will have, there will be vortices everywhere, and these vortices are going to move around the way I said they do. So that, that's well understood. And so you know how many vortices, there's a formula for the number of vortices uh, at some temperature above TBKT. And, and furthermore, there's a very classical picture for how these things degrade the current, which is completely analogous to how a soccer ball curves uh, when, it's, when it's spinning. Okay, so you have these spinning, spinning vortices, they're in a, in a, in a, in a gradient of, of the superfluid, and they experience a force, which is sometimes called a superfluid Magnus force, in which, which basically tells you that, that if you, they don't want to sit still, they want to, they want to relax, they want to move up and, and relax, relax the superfluid. So this is a completely classical, completely classical calculation where you have a, some classical configuration of the superfluid and you calculate the forces acting on it and you see how it moves, okay? Uh, so this was done in a classic paper by, by Dean and Stephen in, in, in 65, okay, so. Yes, same things. So the BKT physics, gives you the vortices, and then this physics moves them around and creates current. So even by the standards of yesterday, this is a renewable physics. Okay, it's been understood for, for a long time. Um, so, so, and then what's the idea? So once these vortices move, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm still on this line. <laughs> so the vortices move, okay, now, uh, so I gave you a sort of topological picture of why that would relax the supercurrent. But more quantitatively, what happens is that the core of the vortices is in the normal state. So there's just normal electrons there, it's not superfluid. So basically when you move them, you create a normal current, not a superfluid current, and that current heats up. And this simple sort of force calculation that these guys did gives you this decay rate, and it's proportional. NF is the number of free vortices without signs. So both in the modulus of the vorticity, it doesn't matter, they don't count, plus and minuses don't cancel, just how many vortices there are. AV is the, the area of the vortex. And sigma n is the conductivity of the normal state. And that makes sense, because these basically what happens, you can imagine the current sort of going through the vortex, and when it goes through the vortex, it, it behaves like a normal, it's a normal state. So you get dissipation due to the normal, the normal state conductivity in the core of the vortex. Okay, so the ingredients here are hopefully, hopefully natural, right? So how many vortices you have, how, how big they are, and how, how much dissipation you generate when, it when the current goes, goes through the vortex. Okay. This is the core size, yes. Yes, sorry. That's correct. You have this picture that the vortices go, go around the land. Yes. And you say that the motion is driven by the current going through the hole. I mean, that, that's exact. Uh, if you like, that's good. It sort of all works out self consistently. That's going to give the rate at which these things get pushed around, basically. So this is all totally unambiguous and has been well known for a long time. Now, what is uh, rather controversial, and we'll see why, is driven by some experiments, is whether this kind of physics can survive at zero temperature. Okay? Whether there are, and whether you can have what would be called a phase disordered superconductor, so some, something that wants to be superfluid, but, has vortice, but where the superfluidity is getting relaxed and the phase is getting disordered by some proliferation of vortices uh, at, zero, at zero temperature. That certainly BKT physics won't do that for you. Okay? But this question of whether that, so this, if such a phase of matter exists, it would be called a quantum phase disordered superconductor, okay? So let me show you why you might care about such things. Uh, yes, this is, yes, that's correct. Yes. Actually, it also assumes that the vortices are big enough, 
that they sort of locally thermalized, they're in a thermal equilibrium inside the vortex. So this is a, it's a, it's a completely classical calculation. It's just forces acting on a, on a spinning object in a, in a simple fluid. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. All right. So now what's going to happen next is, firstly, I'm going to show you very, very quickly some, some experiments that have motivated this question. There's really been a big fight raging for the last 30 years in condensed matter physics about whether this stuff can happen at zero temperature or not. And then I want to develop, uh, you know, I, I, this Bardeen Stephen paper is not easy for me to read, and so I want to develop a, a fully quantum and effective field theoretic formalism uh, to discuss the connectivity of phase disorder superconductors. In particular, I don't know, it's, it's not going to be, there's going to be nothing classical there. It could, in principle, apply at zero temperature. And we're going to illustrate this formalism with two examples. And so the first one will be what I think is a nice re-derivation of, of, of this formula. And, and second, we're going to consider a more exotic case where you have some Chern Simons field interacting with the, with the vortices. Okay. So, so very quickly, some, some experiments. Okay. So this is all in two spatial dimensions. So there was an expectation before these experiments happened about what, what they should find. We'll see, we'll see what the experiments do in a minute. And that is, so in two dimensions, as you may know, there's something called Anderson localization wants to win. It's logarithmically relevant, and so as you go to zero temperature, metals are supposed to be insulating at, at zero, due to disorder. Free electrons are supposed to be insulating at zero temperature, unless uh, they pair up and form bosons uh, before they become insulating. And so the two states of matter that were anticipated in two space dimensions based on weakly coupled intuition were that you could get a superconductor if the electrons pair, or you get an insulator if they localize, but you shouldn't be able to get a metal. Okay. Uh, so one expects to find either insulator or superconductor. And so an experiment, several early experiments in the, the early 90s, late 80s, effectively found that. So they took a disordered uh, thin film and they tuned, for example, a magnetic f field or the amount of disorder in the film, which is effectively the thickness, it turns out, and they saw what are called superconductor insulator transitions between these two phases. So let's say you cool it down in superconducting, then you add a magnetic field, the magnetic fields want to kill superconductivity, and so once you, then what you expect to see is when you kill the superconductivity, it becomes insulating, okay? And so, so you get plots like, like these ones. So let's look at this one. These are the original, the two original papers. This is with magnetic fields. This one is with the, sorry, this one's with magnetic fields. This one's with the thickness. So here, this is temperature and this is the resistance. So as you cool it down, um, above a certain thickness, it, let's call it in quotes, superconducting. Certainly the resistivity gets very small. Whilst if you're above a certain thickness, the resistivity gets very large, okay? And so this is, these are called, the thought of as insulators, these are thought of as superconductors, okay? And that this is an example of a quantum phase. So at zero, the zero temperature phase of matter goes, changes between these two. Here it's with a magnetic field. And so again, um, above a certain field, the resistivity looks like it's wanting to become insulating and below a certain field, it's wanting to become superconducting, okay? Those are, those are the... Uh, uh, so as this uh, big fight, second order, I mean second order. So, so let, let, is there even a transition? All right, let, let's see. So, so, so people did scaling analysis here and things clapped very nicely. And for a while, everybody was very happy that there was a second order quantum phase transition with a nice universal resistivity in between these two. And that, that may still be the case, but uh, let's see. Okay. All right. Um, now, but in fact, as you can really, this is something that was sort of staring everybody in the face, but this is, this is a very interesting example here. So clearly, you know, the resistivity is finite here. It's not infinite or, or, or zero, okay? And this fact was just basically ignored by everybody uh, until, uh, okay, I think the history might be uh, controversial, but anyway, these people pointed out that the resistivity was just finite, <laughs> okay? All right, so... Um, <laughs> So, 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 uh, you know, th there are fights about, is it really finite? Is it experimental artifact? You know, th th it gets very low temperatures, it's, it's subtle, okay. But, so, it seems, so what's more problematic for conventional, more conventional understanding is that, in, especially in certain weakly disordered films, it looks like in between the superconduct and the insulating phase, there's a metallic phase, meaning the resistivity is finite in a zero temperature limit, okay, over some intermediate range of, of uh, magnetic fields. And so, for example, that's what this plot is showing. Here they're plotting the resistivity against 1 over T, 
and they're really emphasizing that it's, it, it looks like it's going to a constant as t goes to zero. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's universally agreed on that this phase is real, but okay, it, it might be. And this curve is showing this is. I don't, I don't really have time to talk about this. is showing a data collapse of the sort that people were, were happy with. And these lines are showing that the data collapse is breaking down as you go to low, lowest temperatures. Okay. Let, let. Yes, yes, lots of people. No, but you see, the first plots, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it's <laughs> uh, you know, <coughs> okay. um, these guys made a big fuss about it. That, that's, what, that's what happened. So why did they put forward? Well, so the question is, what's what's if you had a, a perfect experimental it, you know dissipation could be happening because stuff's leaking out of the system could be the leads you know it, uh, things are not as clean as you'd like them to be most of the time well also no sorry and the point is that theoretical prejudice was that this could not this could not happen yes 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 okay so let me let, let's let's see so what's the picture yes uh interesting question it's certainly relevant for vortices whether you have magnetic fields or not uh, the idea is that they're small enough that that it, it that this landau level quantization is not a dominant effect okay. so now interesting often if, if we believe that this picture that there's a, a a metallic intervening phase the resistivity of this phase is much smaller um, than the resistivity of uh of the high temperature, right? So here, especially you can see that here, right? Let's say this is a finite resistivity. The resistivity is much lower than the, the normal state, the sort of higher temperature resistivity. That suggests that whatever's carrying the current there is not the normal state quasi-particles, but some extra <coughs> collective long-lived mode with a, finite, but with a finite lifetime. And so it suggests a low energy degree of freedom of the metallic phase are not the normal state quasi-particles. It's natural to think of them as failed superconductors where necessarily quantum phase fluctuations because we're in a zero temperature limit, have disordered the phase and caused, so I, I guess I didn't emphasize this in this formula I showed before. Of course, here if you put omega equals zero, the conductivity is now finite, right? Because you're relaxing the supercurrents. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I, I'm not inventing this. This has been, this, 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 this proposal has been out there for a long time. Yes, these things are looked at, have been looked at, yes. Because uh, I'm going to run out of time, let, let me, let me, let me, come. no, but it, it's, so, no, no, it's, uh, so now the, the direct motivation for really focusing on the Druda peak with these, these experiments, and so these guys took one of these films in this intermediate region where it potentially uh, is a metal, and they looked at the optical connectivity, which is the frequency dependent guy, okay? And so this thing that I told you before, this, this connectivity is going like one over, you know, this is otherwise known as a, as a Druda peak. I like to call it a Druda-like peak because the physics is not Druda physics. It has to do with this superconductivity. And so what these guys basically saw is that okay, in this intermediate range of magnetic fields, uh, there, is, there, is sort of, there is a nice Druda peak that's well fit by this formula. Okay, so they can, now, the nice thing about this experiment is that you really see this time scale. Okay, you see the width directly, okay, which just by looking at the DC conductivity, you don't see. And so what they're showing here this is a function of magnetic field. And um, right, so if here it's superconducting, here it's metallic. And what this line is showing, this is the width, this is this width. And they're showing that as they go to, as it becomes superconducting, this width is going to zero, meaning this time scale is going to infinity. So that, so as you're zooming in here, there really is a long time scale, which is this superfluid relaxation rate. Okay, that, that's, um, and then eventually, so basically the Druda peak becomes infinitely thin, then it becomes a delta function, and this curve is the, the weight, the spectral weight in the delta function, the coefficient of the delta function. So this is showing you that superconductivity is dying. Okay, this is rho s, it's being driven to zero. And this is showing at the same point, coming from the other side, this Druda peak becomes, becomes thin. So this is all supposed to make you think that the width of this peak is being set by fluctuating superconductivity, not, not by something else, okay? That it, it disappears, that the supercurrent, the superfluid relaxation rate is going to zero as you go to the superconducting transition, okay? That, that's what you might expect, all right. So there have been many, many papers uh, talking about this kind of physics. Sorry, yes, uh, so from the left to the right. Sorry, good. So, so what, this is, what this plot is trying to show you is that at the same point, two things are happening depending whether you come from the left or the right. If you come from the left, you have a, super, a superconductor, 
And so schematically, the connectivity is rho s times some delta function, okay? And this curve is showing this rho s go to zero, the weight of the, of the, of the delta function. Delta function is sort of the same as, as one of omega, okay? But if you come from the other side, the width of this peak is going to zero. Now, if the width of this peak was just due to quasi part to the decay of electrons, it wouldn't, there's no reason it should go to zero at the same point that it becomes superconducting. Okay. And with going to zero, is making up the delta function. Yes, I, yes, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yes. Um, so, of course, there are many, you know, hundreds of papers on, on this stuff. Most of it involves semi microscopic models with uncontrolled approximations, which that's not to say that they're useless, but that, that, that's what, what they mostly are. But here I'm including, I'm being a bit uncool, and this includes things like epsilon expansions where you, where you can control this thing but not in a dimension that you, that you, that you, that you care about. Um, so instead what we want to do is take a more effective field theory approach and build a theory around a hierarchy of time scales. In particular, we're going to use this fact that close to the transition, the superfluid relaxation rate becomes small, right? There's a long time scale. And I want to build an effective field theory sort of in expansions of that, of that time scale. Temperature, for example. But so, by long by long time scale, I just mean long compared to other typical time scales in the problem. It could be temperature at zero temperature. It might be the chemical potential or something. And uh, the approach we're about to take was inspired, but does not in any way use studies in various holographic systems for the past few years. That I've been thinking about where momentum relaxed slower than everything else, but now it's not momentum; it's the supercurrents. Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm going to run out of time. So let me just maybe sketch some points. So the idea is the following. You're going to imagine that your, your Hamiltonian, you split it up into two parts. Um, and the part, is a, so J phi is going to be a supercurrent operator, which I'll define in a second. That almost, so we want that to be almost conserved because it's long lived. So it commutes with most of the Hamiltonian, but doesn't commute with this small bit. Now epsilon at the end of the day is not going to be a parameter. That I'm just putting it there to say this is small, of course what we want is the operator to be irrelevant or to be marginal with a small, with a small coupling so that this thing will naturally be small. Using something called the memory matrix formalism that actually also goes back to uh, a favorite time period, um, um, you can just show that whenever this happens, whenever you have a long-lived quantity that overlaps with the current, so this is a thermodynamic susceptibility that measures the overlap so this is literally, take the free energy, you take the source conjugate to J, the source conjugate to J phi, you differentiate the free energy with respect to these sources. So, this is, so the specific heat is an example of such a susceptibility. Okay, susceptibility, it's the overlap. This tells you how much supercurrent does the current carry. And then you can, if you have a long-lived thing, uh, operator, you can, you can just derive that it has to have this Judo form, and furthermore, you can get a formula for omega. I don't have time to go through this mechanism, but it's, it, Hopefully this is quite intuitive. This tells you that the, the weight, the, the, what we call the Druda weight, is a measure of how efficiently the supercurrent carries a current. That's this, this guy. And then omega is a super, the supercurrent decay rate. And that's given by this, which is also a very intuitive formula. So let me quickly tell you. So it's the imaginary part of a retarded Green's function, which is also known as the spectral weight. Okay? And it's the Green's function of the time derivative of J phi, which is precisely this guy. Okay? Uh, it, it's two-point function. Okay, this omega, let's not worry about it. And so this is a spectral density. And so we could sort of think of this as a souped-up version of Fermi's golden rule, where it tells you that the decay rate is a measure of how many degrees of freedom you have available to decay into. Okay, it's a spectral weight, very, very roughly. And what you care about, so, but the upshot is, is the two-point function. The decay rate is a two-point function of the long-lived quantity, of, of the time of J phi dot. Okay? of j phi dot. It's a two-point function of j phi dot. And this is very natural because if j phi does not decay, if j phi dot is zero, okay, then omega is zero and you get back your infinite connectivity. Right? So the nice thing about this memory matrix is it, so this is a two-point function of currents. It rearranges a two-point function and expresses it in terms of a two-point function of time derivatives. That, that's why it's a useful framework whenever you have a slow, long-lived quantity. All right, and then so the effective field theory name of the game is that you say, well, you have to specify. Also, all, the nice thing about this is all you have to specify is this part of the Hamiltonian that doesn't that doesn't conserve the currents. Um, 
yeah, how to do this fast. So, okay, so J phi is, is this, right? It's the, the total phase. Now you want something, a terminal Hamiltonian that doesn't commute to the phase, okay? So what is that, how do we build those? Well, the thing that doesn't commute to something, the, a nice thing to use is the conjugate momentum. That certainly doesn't commute. It turns out the conjugate momentum to the phase is the charge density, okay? This is a simple thing. Um, and so if we build an operator out of the charge density, it won't, so that's Coulomb interactions, okay? And so, so the physics here is that there's an uncertainty principle that says variations in the charge times variations in the phase are bigger than h bar. So Coulomb interactions, charge interactions don't like variations in the charge, okay, because they cost energy. And so a charge interaction suppresses variations in the charge, but that then requires variations in the phase to increase, and so that tends to disorder the phase, okay? So Coulomb interactions are anything that involves charge interactions are the enemy of superconductivity, all right? Uh, so now an effective filter, we want to, we want to, so, so let's, let's take, you know, Coulomb interactions are, of course, screened in a metal and so on. So you can, a simple operator you can take is this local, uh, is this local term. And it is effect, it's effective filter in the sense that you could add higher derivative terms like grad rho squared and so on. And those, are, those will be more suppressed, okay? Okay, so you can take the commutator. You want the, you should take the commutator of this operator with the superfluid operator. You get grad rho. And this looks like it's zero because grad phi is non-trivial because phi can wind, but rho is a single-valued operator. It's not allowed to wind. However, this is, this is the, the, a pretty thing, that phi is not defined in the vortex cores, okay, because there's no, you know, you, you haven't broken the symmetry. So actually this integral excludes the vortex cores. And so this is not quite a total derivative. Uh, if, um, if you do the integral and you, get, you so the integral of this everywhere is, is zero, okay, because it's totally, so this outside the vortices is equal to the minus the integral inside the vortices, okay? And then so you end up calculating this two-point function inside the vortices. And it, the two-point function of the charge density-density correlator inside the vortices is by charge conservation related to the current-current two-point function inside the vortices. And that ends up giving you the normal state connectivity, okay? So that was a little fast. But this is this nice argument. And so we get, we get on the nose with factors of pi and two and everything, this, this Bardeen Stephen formula, okay? Yes, you have to make it, exactly. So if it's small, then uh, it's just a microscopic number that you're gonna get, yes. So where they, they're naturally large, close to phase transitions, the vortices tend, tend to go like the correlation link. So I think it's nice, because, uh, I'll be like one more minute, yeah. The nice thing about this, so, you know, it was a mix of, uh, you know, being unhappy and happy that we derived an, uh, a known result. <laughs> But at least it means this is right, and it's a, it's a. But it's a totally quantum derivation. There's no classical motion of vortices, or, or, or it couldn't. Right. Okay. So I am the last minute, despite what you told me not to do. Uh, we had another another example of something that doesn't commute. Is, I think this is quite interesting. Is uh, is if you have a chern simons field. So, and as as Nadi said yesterday, chern, emergent U1 chern simons fields are not the most exotic thing in kinetics matter. They 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 happen. Okay. And so suppose you have an emergent U1 gauge field with the chern simons term that, couple, that, couples to, that also couples to the charge. If you integrate it out, you generate this so-called Hopf interaction that some of you may have seen before. And in a non-relativistic limit, it becomes this. So this is now a, a charge current interaction, okay? And it's non-local because we integrated out uh, the master's field. And it turns out this non-locality, this inverse derivative undoes the total derivative, okay? So, you know, there's this great, there was a sort of, we had this integral grad phi that look, looked like it, it's a total derivative, but you actually get a non-zero commutator. I, I'm really close to being done, I promise. Um, so this, this chern simons term also gives you a non-zero time derivative, and I'll give you the simple picture and then I'll, I'll stop. So it goes as follows. Um, okay, you, you, you set up a supercurrent. You set up a current. That means charge is moving, okay? Now, as many of you may know, what chern simons terms do is uh, glue magnetic flux to charge, okay, in this case, the emergent magnetic flux. So this charger moving now comes with a little emergent magnetic flux. But this little emergent magnetic flux creates a little vortex through the superfluid, okay, because it turns out we coupled, it went a bit quickly, but this emergent flux also coupled to the, the charge in the same way. So you get an emergent, so then you get a flow of vortices. The chern simons term drags, actually, it's a trans, you, you get a, this is what this thing is saying. Well, you get a flow of vortices and then a vortices relax the supercurrent, as I, as I told you. Okay, so chern, this chern simons interaction has this nice 
yeah, it glues, it, it forces there to be vortices that then end up degrading the currents, okay? And um, this is nice because in this case, the, the relaxation rate that you get, I know this is very fast, it, it turns out it, 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 it doesn't depend on the, anything that's happening inside the vortices. It turns out it depends on the normal component. So when you have a, when you have a superfluid, there's a normal, there's a normal component and a, and, a, and a superfluid component. And it the, 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 turns out the charge dra that's dragging the vortices is the normal component, but I don't, don't have time. So anyway, this is a new mechanism for relaxing uh, supercurrent, I think, as a chance of surviving at zero temperature. Okay, I'll just summarize. So uh, I told you that superfluid relaxation happens uh, if perturbations of the effective Hamiltonian don't commute with the supercurrent. And secretly, we know that it has to be related to motion of vortices. And then I started with perturbations of superfluid hydrodynamics as a controlled entry point. So I'm not starting in the UV. I'm saying I've got hydro, and then I'm going to add this delta H term to the Hamiltonian that breaks. It introduces a relaxation rate for one of the hydrodynamic variables, and all I need to calculate is that relaxation rate. In particular, there's no assumption of weak coupling or anything. And we gave two examples with and without parity. I didn't emphasize that. So we, we recovered the body and Stephen formula with parity and without parity. Okay, I also didn't tell you this. This Chern Simons, it, it, there's a certain collective mode, which uh, the whole, this, this relaxed superfluid, not only does it relax, uh, but it oscillates at a certain frequency that we call the supercyclotron mode. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, good. So, yes, I should say, um, um, I don't think we have a strong connection to those experiments yet. Mostly what we have, looking to the, f yes, I mean, they have magnetic fields. Uh, definitely, definitely very good. So, some of them do and some of them don't, is, is, the, is the short answer. Uh, I don't, and I don't think, so even though I said uh, emergent Chen Simons is, relatively mundane, it's also a little bit fancy, and I don't think these materials have emergent chern simons fields in them, okay. Uh, however, what, what we, um, we have not systematically looked through possible, you know, low dimension op terms that we could add to the Hamiltonian. And so what we have at the moment is a quantum framework that if we find the right operator, you know, the right term in the Hamiltonian should be capable of describing these materials, but I don't think we have the right term yet. Right, so you, yes, you, you could in print, so you could worry about whether it's, it's valid there, but if the other, the main issue, I'm sorry? Yes, yes, so what, exactly, so what, what so the, the, the two issues here is that probably in a conventional understanding, NF would go to zero, there wouldn't be any vortices at zero temperature, and furthermore, the cores, which are in the normal state, want to localize, so probably this connectivity is, uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, okay, let, let's figure that one for a moment. Probably they know that there just shouldn't be any vortices at zero temperature in a conventional understanding. So it could be that this formula is correct at zero temperature. In fact, very good. Our derivation definitely holds at zero temperature. So I think this formula is correct, but NF could well be zero because there's no, there's no so the, the question about whether you proliferate vortices is a different set of physics that I haven't, that I haven't talked about. Yes, I'm certainly now. I have a momentary confusion about sigma n, but let, let me let me let me come let me leave that. I think yeah. to 